it's all about um, it's, it's really just the state of mind of like what Mary Louise, her, her uh, son was saying, you know, well, Mom, do you really want to drive home? It's dark, and, you know, you're 85, and you've got guests in the car, and this and that, and, you know, maybe you want to let one of them drive, and she's like, oh. And then she got in the car, so there we all were in the car. And <laughs> what? I mean, she was cruising. She didn't miss a thing. I mean, she's sharp. I mean, really sharp. And it's the state of mind. We're not trying to endorse, we're not trying to say there's a healthy body and a sick body. And For safety and danger. And safety yeah. and danger. What we're saying is there's a state of mind that's available when you really train your mind to live in the present. Mm-hmm. And that's really what we're I'd like to read about. something out of Course in Miracles that says that. That's my, one of my favorites. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Yes. Everything begins and ends in your mind. Well, part of what my, my, tra- my training, I call it training now, um, is that um, I drive to Central. I, work, I live in McKinney and I work down here. And um, so I was driving, and I got to a place where I was having road rage. It was so bad. I got so fierce. And cars would come and cut me off, and I swear they were out to get me every day. You know, (laughs) they were. (laughs) Times a day, I would almost have accidents. And, And it was just consistent. And then I came to the place where I went. I'm just going to bless these cars. That's all I need to do. I'm just going to bless them. They're not out. It's not personal. <laughs> and um, I started doing that. And the more I did that, the less it happened. And now, when I drive, I, I uh, people let me in. They pull over for me. I have the road for myself. Um, I have parking spots everywhere up front. And none of the other, the previous happens anymore but I changed mm-hmm. they didn't change and they right. still cut me off or appear to cut me off they really don't now they come in front of me and I pray for safety for them and I cover them around with light and when traffic is just stopped I I just send this I don't know how to describe it like this sh- uh, shoot of light out and the energy actually gets the cars moving it appears. I don't know. That's my perception, but see, that's right. <laughs> yeah, because it does, and it's like, wow, it's so different because I just changed. That's, that was it. Well, you could go down to Walmart, and you could have a real negative perception. Parking lot's full. I have to park way out here, so you drive way out there and park. But if you said there are people who just are through shopping and they're parked way out front and it's about time for them to leave. Yeah. You can drive up there and wait a few seconds. Yeah, yeah here comes the people and they're getting their car and waiting mm-hmm. to go. There's a parking space there. Yeah. It's just a matter you didn't even drive in there to check it in the first place. So lots of times if you think the world is okay and just assume that, it is okay because... And part, of what I'm it learning, is okay. part of what I'm learning is that my world is in the present moment, whatever that is. And so that it's not in anything that's in experience that's going on, or the situation, uh, Eckhart calls it the life situation. That it's not in that, but it's in this present moment and what's going on in me, mm-hmm. and my connection to it. And so everything, again, I go back to everything is reflective for me, and for... You know, if, I, if I'm upset, then that's there as a gift, and I look at that. And if I'm really happy, which it's like happiness and the and the gift are not separate anymore. And so it's does that make sense? Kind of no. Yeah. I, y- yeah do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. That it's not. There's no difference. Of good and evil, evil, or, mm-hmm. or being oh, rude yeah. or not rude. There's no difference anymore because if they're rude and I react to it, that's my gift because that's about me, and I can look at that. I can experience that feeling and bring presence to it, and then being happy is being present, but it's not any different than the other. It's all good. <laughs> as, you, as you continue with this, you you will cease to even be able to perceive rude because 
There's no like rudeness. No rudeness in the present. In other words, how you just described it, it's like you, you know, it just dissolves, dissolves, dissolves as you focus present, present, well, present. Some of that's already yeah. starting to happen because yeah. it's more compassion. Compassion comes up instead of visualizing it being rude. I sometimes see someone and, and have more compassion than anything. I mean, I don't see the rudeness. Yeah. I just see that. inside you. It's just... Yeah. You see this car that's going real slow in front of you, and the crude thing to do is say, God, it's an idiot up there. They're going so slow. How could they ever go so slow? And then you look at it through better eyes, and you say, well, they're probably lost. They're, they're probably had car trouble. They're on the cell phone. For it. <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely on the cell phone. I guarantee you that. <laughs> that's an important call. <laughs> In L.A., a good way to reason not to, to offend them or say anything is because you might get shot. <laughs> That's like that movie, L.A. Well, story, I'm where they cut him out of the season, and, and uh, Steve Martin gets, they cut him off, and he gets his gun out, and they're shooting. But he's talking, I think he's talking to his cell phone, or he's talking to his friend, and he's just going like this, you know, out the window, and, and the whole movie's a spoof on on the extremes of, uh, it's called L.A. Story, if any of you ever get a chance. I'll be your robber today. Yeah, right. I'll be your robber. And they're all lined up. They've got all the people lined up at the ATM machine and a whole line of robbers, and one after another, they come up, and the one goes, I'll be your robber today. Thank you. I'll be your robber today. He just spooks the whole, the whole thing, you know, and it's just, just hilarious. You know? But in the end, it's that's his movie about the power of the mind, because you know he he he's able to use the weather and, and everything to, as a symbol to to have a change of mind at the very end of that movie. It's just precious. Yes, I, I was seeing a difference in what uh, she was saying here about bringing presence to it. Or going over here with George saying and turning it into a different story. I think there's a quantitative difference between that. Yeah. Because I'm trying to convince, use my mind to convince myself things are good, and the other way I'm actually right. going beyond the level of mind to presence. Yeah. In a sense, if you think you need to rearrange the story around, you're, it's really you're just kind of fooling yourself a little bit. When you go to the present, you dissolve the whole thing right there. Okay. And so I tell people when they think about rearranging the story or revisualizing things, recreating things and so on and so forth, it's it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> the compartments are filling up. <laughs> that baby is going down. <laughs> Even if you watch the movie Titanic, the engineer who built it, you know, asked how many compartments <laughs> have filled up with the thing and, and they told him, he said, It's sunk. Before it sunk, he, he he knew that ship inside and out. So so if you're in a in a, a thing of personal judgment and you're trying to keep rearrange the story to get a better story, a more helpful story, a, a, a improved story, think of that that metaphor <laughs> of the Titanic. It's going down. It's halfway in there, and you're over there trying to move the chairs around. You know, I mean that's about as futile as it is. Versus going to the present. Versus saying, I need to come back, I need to come back to the present of non-judgment. And then it's just, you know, it's dissolved. And that's, like you say, that's a quantitative, <laughs> that's, a, that's a real distinction there. And I can even, even be on the Titanic, going down, being in the present moment. Yeah, right. Being in the present moment. Enjoying the ride. <laughs> <laughs> My heart goes on and on and on. Just remember the theme song, you know. But it's such a beautiful theme song about, and even at the end of that movie where the, the old woman like you know goes down through it all, and she's she's able to go down and, and go down to the to the Titanic and all this, and go back to that memory of meeting her her boyfriend at the clock and everything, and everybody's standing and applauding. Just think of that of all the characters in your life. Instead of trying to string them together in a linear way, the good ones, the bad ones, the ones that loved you, the ones that tortured you, that you can come to the present moment. And it's almost like they're all there giving you a standing ovation. You got it! You saw that we're all the same. It was only your own judgments that which of us were good or evil or the villains or the, you know, whatever. I love that scene where they're all applauding, you know, when she goes back down, because that's, that's a, 
that's a present moment experience of, you know, that everything's perfect. Everything was perfect. You just thought it wasn't. I just realized, I'm glad. Go ahead. I just realized that I, like, um, forget to stay in the present moment. Um, in different, you know, because, because the feelings are coming up. And I guess, I think that's the thing that clouds me. I, I get confused and forget. And, um, I assume, I mean, it's just la- there can be layers and layers on that. And it's hard sometimes just to stay with that. But I can certainly see the value of it if I can remember. If you allow them to come up, and no matter what they are, um, I was telling a story recently where Resta called me within the past year sometime, and she just called and the phone rang, and I answered, and she said, I'm in hell! I'm in hell! <laughs> oh! I've been in hell for five hours! I'm in hell! And she really so, uh, was very distraught. And I just burst into laughter. I just, I just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed, and then after finally I stopped laughing, she said, Okay. Funny. When you were in hell, what did you do? <laughs> and I said, well, there was a time where I just, um, I found a chair, and I just went in and I sat down and I said, all right, I've got nowhere to go, go and nothing to do. I have no other purpose than to be at peace. It's, there's no consequences. I said, I'm not leaving this chair <laughs> until I'm, I'm back in the moment, until I'm free and everything. And, uh, and it worked. I told her, I said, you know, I just it was like, I'm not going to go and pretend to go through the motions while it's still, you know, churning. I was like taking a stand, you know, like, mm-hmm. here I am, and I, I don't care how you feel, <laughs> or whatever is going to come up, I'm, I'm going to move through you, and, and with determination come back to the present. I seem to do okay with that, if it's that kind of situation, but if, if it's in conversation with someone else, it's harder to remember because I'm constantly drawn back into the conflict. And, you know what I mean? It seems to me more, it's like what you're saying, it's simpler when you can recognize, what, whenever, just notice whenever you're upset. Mm-hmm. Just And that's like a, the trigger of an even come back. I mean, but when I'm in conversation, I'm getting upset, and then I'm, you know, you saying it. I'm expressing the anger back and forth. But even that is the feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You should, you know, the, yeah. And it's all coming from an interpretation, you know. Right. I like that idea. No one can be angry at a fact. Right. And so it's always it's a misinterpretation that's producing the anger. Mm-hmm. And you know, it does. That's why it helps to go deeper in your mind. I've, I've drawn out diagrams of the mind, um, how the mind works, and all kinds of things, and all these, and have put out tapes for years and years and years to train, help train the mind, but. If you think of your mind as kind of like concentric circles, at the core of it is your desire. And just by the desire for something more than everything is how this world seemed to arise. It would be like saying, oh, this is wonderful. Could there be more than everything? Zoom. <laughs> there's, there's a cosmos, you know. And then the belief in separation is in there, the next ring, and then the thought realm. Your thoughts come from your, your belief system. And then out here is your emotions, so they're much further out. And then the perceptual world that you perceive, the gross perceptual world that you seem to see with the five senses and perceive is way out here on the outer ring. So this whole thing is a cause-effect relationship that your emotions produce the world you see. The Course says you first look within and decide how you feel, and then you look outside and see a world. So if you're talking to somebody and you seem to be in a disagreement, and they're saying stuff and you're just feeling... Mm-hmm. That you know you're getting angry in a hurry and, and even expressing that mm-hmm. anger, that's going on way out here. But those emotions are produced by thoughts, and those mm-hmm. thoughts are produced by beliefs. And in the end, it's your desire. That's where the little willingness comes in. That, that there's no formula for reaching God because that would be way out here on the perceptual ring of the how tos. Give me a formula. Tell me a mm-hmm. mantra, or you know, tell me what to do, and I'll do it's a it. Secret. What's the secret? Give me the secret formula. That would be out here. It's, it's, the Course says, you know, truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. Not messing with the other rings. It's saying you've got an altar in the core of your mind. And as uh, long as you have idols and want something other than God, that's what's going to spring. I've one of your recent emails on Yahoo Groups. I was most amazing message. 
science and everything. It makes it so clear. It just shows you what's going on in your mind and how you don't want to tinker out here because this is just being produced by what's by the inner rings. Let me go a little deeper with what you're saying. So you have your beliefs. Now it feels like there's like a fear inside of that. Yeah. It, it, what is that? Well, it's the fear of God. That's in other words, fear. the ego is the belief system, mm-hmm. and forgiveness is going to be the release of that belief, that entire mm-hmm. belief system. And the ego says, "I'll be gone. Mm-hmm. I'll be obliterated. I won't exist anymore." See, God has become the unknown to this, to the mind in this world, and this world becomes familiar. And you hear people in 12-step groups, they talk about they're addicted to their misery. You know, that's, that's what the human condition is, is getting, getting addicted to misery, even though it's, it's miserable, if there's a familiarity to familiar it, is the word. familiar that makes it comfortable, it's, comfortable, it's right. a comfortable misery. Right. It's familiar then, territory. Yeah, and now you're being guided towards the present moment, towards light and love and joy, and to the ego, that's obliteration. I mean, it feels like it's it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be out of a job. Out of a job completely. Right. So that's where the fear comes. So that's why we, in the end, we have to disidentify from the ego and come back to our spirit and, and identify with that present moment because that's the only way way out of it. So what do you do? <laughs> what do you do out here? What's the formula? What's the formula? Heal the middle. What's your question? You had something coming up. You had to look at the willingness. So the eager couching, um, that fear of God as um, a sense of guilt. And that what that guilt is, it's like this pervasive guilt. And I can always identify it and it feels the same, I know it is, but it's like, I can't quite put my finger on it because I know I shouldn't be guilty. It's not. It's ontological. It's the belief that you. It's unworthiness. It's mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not worthy. I'm not. Something wrong has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. It's it's an ontological guilt for the belief that you can separate from God, and it gets projected around guilt around food or guilt around weight or guilt around sex or you know all these things are projections mm-hmm. to try to to keep from discovering the deep seated belief that you can separate from your Creator. And how is that exposed? I know that's a big question, but... Just for willingness. It's back to, okay. to what he's been saying. You know, willingness, willingness to... Willingness not to protect anything. When those emotions come up and, and those things... Look are, at it. Yeah, real. the more you look it's at real. it... It's real. It's real. It's just eternal. It's real. <laughs> it does. But when you bring it to the light, isn't it, isn't it really real? Right. Okay. Is it God created this? And ask if it's eternal. That's the thing. Guilt. Take faith to let it come up. I mean, I feel like my life was, I had, okay, I had the lid on. And I'm like, so you take the lid off. And, ah! <laughs> then, right, here, right, sometimes it's, yeah, it's little. Put, put the lid back on. But then when you start, that's what all the things yeah. did. She said, I was the drag girl until I met you. Me too, I was the drag girl. I'm going to I'm going to I don't think that ever happened to me. Oh, what's down there? I was the total joy girl. And all of a sudden, I started having these feelings like I was never, that I wasn't allowing to come up. And I felt so, it felt oh, so uncomfortable to me. Mm-hmm. And you know what? While we were traveling, you know, and I was stuck in the car with them for 11 days. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. And I want it. That's true. I am going. She hid behind I am well. Don't give me that loving look. Because after about, after about, like, <laughs> five or six days... Did that you know, surprise you? Did that surprise it you? It really did. What yeah. really surprised me because I wasn't expecting. I thought we were or wanted. Right. Well, and the whole thing is, is they knew it all along. That's what I know. That they knew stuff was going to come up. I had no idea, and all of a sudden these things were coming up, and I was trying to put a lid on them. And that's what. Well, what I've come to find out mm-hmm. is the hardest part is keeping the lid on. Yeah. So it is exhausting. And I was running, and well, what ha- ended up happening is I said, well, I was going into these gatherings, and you would feel all this love. And uh, I had been uh, basically by myself for quite a few years, and i go into these gatherings, and it was beautiful, and all this love, and, and being traveling with them, it was feeling all this love, and this joy, this peace, and how much I was realizing how I had a hard time looking in people's eyes after a while. But it was like my eyes were... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, my eyes were like they kind of splitting. <laughs> like, don't look at me anymore. <laughs> and and then, then we went out to dinner one night, and that was when they were like looking at me. <laughs> like talking, and I, I mean, I wanted to crawl underneath the table. And I was trying, I didn't know what it was either, yeah. but I was feeling this, and I thought, why, what is this feeling that I'm having? I didn't even know it. And so I ended up being in this resistance for a couple of days, and then I ended up getting sick. <laughs> I mean, really, very, very ill. <clears throat> but I never get sick. I never am a sick person. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then uh, uh, they let me do what I needed to do because then I went in the back of the car and I put pillows up and barricaded myself in the back of the car. <laughs> so I didn't have to see them. I said, you know, I just want to be in here and just be out of my own space. I'm used to being alone and uh, being still. And um, having to go through it. And then I even went and got a hotel room. I didn't go to one of the grat gatherings. And then I, I was like glad to go home. Okay, uh, to to filter all this stuff out that I was feeling, and then we talked again, and then all the this stuff was coming up, and I was realizing how much I feared love. Never did I ever expect to know that I, I could fear love. I was the joy girl. I thought I was the most loving person, and how much I ran and hid from love, and how much resistance that we have to it. I mean, it's intense. You know, to know how much God loves us, you know, it's it's really intense. It was like, uh, you know, how you're looking at the sun, the light. It was actually hurting my eyes. And um, so I ran and I hid for a while uh, from it. There were a couple processes I went to, but I really hid for a while from it. But in my hiding, I was in hell. I was in pure hell. Yeah. I, the only thing, my only choice was is to... Go to the light. <clears throat> go to the love. Go to the joy. Go to God. And you go in the presence and stop hiding. And so, once I stopped hiding, boy, I feel great. No, <laughs> you know, good. once I stopped and, and really recognizing that that's what it was and, and recognizing how much fear is involved in that and bringing it to the light and being honest with that and saying, I am really scared to death of love. You know, that intimacy. Of, of being that close to somebody because of our past learning of becoming vulnerable, you know, that uh, I could possibly get hurt, well, hurt so. and trust. And that's what happened. I went back and, you know, I started reading the course again. I've been studying it for years. And that was the thing that certain words like stick out mm -hmm. at me when I'm reading it. I don't know about you guys, but certain things just. It hits me. I've never seen it. it looked, I read it a hundred times, but this is the first time I saw this one. <laughs> and the word came out of, in there, and it said trust, like 3D. <laughs> <laughs> and there it was, trust in God. Trust. And that's been my new thing now. Trust. That came out of me. And you know what? When you trust, you're in peace. And... Uh, and in God, he wants to give us it all. But you don't realize how much he really wants to give you. You know, which is this, you know, relinquishment of all of your things that you thought were important. He wants to give us this uh, unconditional love, unconditional peace, unconditional uh, everything, you know. And I thought, and this is what I said to David, nothing is always competing with everything. You know, we're used to running, and we're used to hiding. We're addicted to guilt. We're addicted to fear. We're we are not used to feeling this. And when you start feeling it, you see your resistance to it. And it's just amazing to me, you know, to really pay attention to what I'm really feeling here. How, how can you, uh, you know, in the presence of all that love, not want it. You know, that saying, okay, that's enough now. <laughs> I had enough now. And uh, so, what I did was I stopped running. And now that I stopped running, and I'm going into my just being and, and accepting God's love and accepting the gift of peace 
and accepting instead of running. And whatever that means, I'm staying in the now. You know, and I don't know what that means, but I'm enjoying it right now. I'm not running. I'm standing in the light. I'm accepting my salvation. It's my inheritance, damn it. And I want it, and I love it, and it's a, it's like a cuddly, cuddly blanket, and I want it, and it's just so beautiful, and it's, and you know what, it's so beautiful to be in it, and to be with witnesses, jumping in joy with it, you know what I mean, and not, and being like, oh yes, it is beautiful, oh it is a gift, oh it's so beautiful, it's like, it's like you, you're in the light, you are in the light. And, and, and never thinking that our minds are possible. It's like the relinquishment of everything that is not light. And, and bringing it to the light. And seeing the unreality of what is and isn't true. And whatever God creates is eternal. Mm-hmm. Okay? And if it isn't God, we'll bring it to the light. And we'll see if it's eternal. And only God's gifts are eternal, so let's let's bring them to the light. And that's it's taking a little. Always there. It's taking Always a little. Right, right. The light is in, is in us now. It's the light there. is in the right. It's right there. There's nothing to do. It's the acceptance. Huh. Accept, and that's it. And it's so simple. And. Let me tell you, you know, all, it seems like all, it, it's so simple. We're not used to having it being that simple. There's so much I need to do. There's so much I have to, so many years ahead. No, that's not it. It's trust and accept God's gift. He can't give it to us unless we receive it. And trust yourself. And trust. You have to trust yourself. Well, I'm you trusting trust God. God. I'm trusting I know. in in. in I'm, what is happening is the miracles that happen when you do that, you stay, it, they are gifts to show me that I'm on the right road. I now have the greatest peace that I've had and the greatest joy that I've had. And nothing from the other world showed me this. And this is the best thing that's happened to me. And I'm going to go with what feels good. <laughs> and I'm not going to feel guilty about it either. <laughs> So it's all old-fashioned testimony. Yeah, yeah. 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 and it's just like, hey, whatever that means, I don't know. But I'm, I'm going to sit back and take it. Appreciate it. <laughs> Can I ask you one last question here? Um, if you're dealing with somebody that's mentally ill, this is not organic, but it's just that they're really... Uh, have panic attacks and they're... Who says that's not our game? Well, it could be. She's a therapist. All illness is mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll call that. I have a question. Do you have some questions? <laughs> this will be our wrap up. We can oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I want for, for me. I well, didn't hear you. I'm mostly for you. I have a question. Well, you still have a question. Yeah, you can finish what he was saying. Yeah, oh, okay. 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 okay, okay. I'm sorry. But if someone's taking on a lot of tranquilizers and they're um, not necessarily dealing with their problems, is that just a, an extension of what you're talking about? Have not being in the light? Yeah, tranquilizers you might think of as magic. It's a, yeah. It's almost like if you had a potion made of a, a witch's potion for yourself to try to, because you wanted to hold on to the, the guilt or the sickness, but you wanted to alleviate the symptoms or to mediate, make it a little softer, a little easier to accept. You make a little potion. So yeah, tranquilizers is um, kind of like trying to numb out um, which is really distractive. They help you keep it alert. Super pushing it down. Right, super pushing <laughs> yeah. it down. Right, really not dealing with it, but just pushing it down. And uh, and basically, you know, when when the mind chooses uh, a symptom for the body or whatever, whether it's being feeling drugged or feeling illness or whatever, that's a decision of mind because the mind is saying, I want to hang on to my guilt and the world the way I've constructed it. 
and I'm going to call a witness and say, it's something out there. That body is doing it to me. You know, the body's the body's hurting, or the body's this and that. Try to, to, to make up things like um, conditions and non-mental motivators, like instincts. You know, instincts is an attempt of non-mental motivators, but that's why I was sharing with you at the beginning, all illness is mental illness. And it doesn't seem that way. It seems like there's maybe... Um, sometimes that there's physical causes, but there are never is a physical cause. Well, isn't all medicine magic? Yeah, and all medicine is magic. Well, what but, about alcohol? Yeah, same so, thing. Same thing. Kind of exact same thing. Yeah. Or tranquilizers, or whatever. Or sex, or anything that does. Yeah, of, or putting a coat on. You were saying, putting a sweater on, or whatever. Anything that you're using to try to alleviate a discomfort by using something in form to shift. This the deck, deck chairs of the Titanic again, coming around again, <laughs> is really denying that, that the guilt's in, within you and you need to release the grievance or release the attack thought. So that's the best thing to do in those, when, you, when your mind's tempted to make a judgment and say, is it partially physical? It's just to remember, okay, this is a, a mental problem and I need to get back to the present moment for it. <laughs> Question, and then I, I'm not going to, I just want to tell you the feeling. I, in Alcoholics Anonymous, the most time, every time, the only time I ever wanted, I've been sober like 23 years, about it, and going the whole time. The most I ever wanted to drink a bit is at meetings. What a great testimony for that. <laughs> 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 But the, the, whole, the, most <laughs> problem, the most problem I have at, at, uh, with my ego and controlling my ego is that we share it. Because my ego wants to judge what people are saying and how far along they are. If they're as far along as they I'm further along than them. Or blah, 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 blah. And I just have to continually... <laughs> you, you know, <clears throat> but as long as I'm at home in my recliner reading the, the book, meditating and praying and That's everything's fine, but well, I'm in La La Land. But when I, when I have to start That's interacting true. with everybody, then, then I know how, how strong and powerful it <coughs> still is. Well, I'm glad then you show up to these things because yeah. you it really is bring, taking the lid off. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. saying, okay, this is what, and, and right in the face of the Perfect. temptation to judge, you're calling on the miracle, saying, okay, That's Holy Spirit, so I need some willingness here, because I don't like how this feels, this not feels, or whatever. I like right, what he said, she said, they yeah. say, it's not, right. and, and I believe it this way, and if somebody doesn't believe the way I did, but, well, the ego's saying, yes. you know, they sure done it, you know, <laughs> and that, that's part of what I gotta get out of there. But that, that's what I have to do with it is here when we're discussing it. I studied, mm -hmm. I studied, I studied with the guru many years uh, one time and he, he said it kind of judgments and how do you know where everybody is on the path? Because we judge by appearances, of course. Thank you. So he says, he says if it takes 22 blows to break the stone, how do you know where this person is? It could be on number 12, it could be on number 20, he could be on number 5. You don't know by appearances, it could be a bum on the street, but he could be at the 21 blow, and one more blow he's enlightened. Mm -hmm. So you don't know where they are, and you don't know how many blows it takes to become enlightened. Oh, well, 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 I understand that it's a judgment, as well. and, and I, I don't know anything. No, well, you know, well, I, none of us I, I, the book says we know nothing. You know, well, you can judge best by vibrations and feelings. Yeah, but you, the ego is still sitting over there saying, yeah, you're smart. Well, yes. Uh, you're probably <laughs> smarter than most of these people. You know? <laughs> Even though you're smart, I'm very college, you know, and, and all that. Uh, you're still smart. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say we want to thank you all for coming tonight, and we have handouts over on the table and CDs on the bottom. Free CDs, free handouts. Please feel free to take anything uh -huh. that you find there. <laughs> And the CDs are at the bottom, the bottom shelf, and uh, I and think the, they're samplers. The CDs of the gatherings, you need to play them on a computer or an MP3, or a computer with an MP3 format.